Good evening, and you're watching Latino Talk TV. I'm your host, Jose Luis Jimenez. And I'm Ben Mendez. And? And I'm Javier Perez. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're having a good time out there in, uh, in, in Houston, Texas. We're broadcasting to you live here in uh, Houston Media Source on the greater east end of Houston, Texas, here in Harris County. And uh, we're actually really excited about today's show because it's, one, the last show of the year. Uh, you know, and number two, we're going to cover some very interesting topics with some very uh, interesting guests. Because uh, what's happening today is that you know Houston's changing, and with the change comes some really good things. So I'm I'm a, I'm a type of guy that likes change. After a while, you know, it's, I, I'm not afraid of change. You know, Ben Ben's a different story. I don't know about you, but you know, Ben likes yeah, to keep the same mustache. thing. Well, you did, you did, you did. <laughs> but before we get into the uh, topic of the of the day, uh, what's been going on in the community out there, Ben? Well, I'm sad to say the Texans lost. Again. Again. No, no, no. We won the first <laughs> that's right. round draft pick. Oh, well, that's what I, I was going to say next. I <laughs> agree. You got to look at the bright side. You got to look well, at the bright side. I'll tell you what. Uh, it's a bad season for Texans all the way around. Yeah. We're looking at next year, finding out who we're going to recruit for the team. You know what? And but it's, it's going to be a bad. It's going to be a next bad next two, three years. <laughs> we're going to start all over. We're going to have a new coach. We're going to have a rookie quarterback. You know, so we won't probably make the playoffs for another two or three years at the earliest. Well, guaranteed. speaking of football, I, I just did one of the most rudest things I've ever done. I didn't introduce our guests. We got you sitting here, y'all looking at us, looking at us all crazy. So what I'm going to do is I'm let them uh, <laughs> well, introduce themselves. They're supposed to shut up until we tell them, <laughs> right? No, no. Let them introduce themselves and, and who they're here, who they're with, and then we can just get back into the topic so they can jump into. Introduce yourself. Um, my name is Navid Zanjani. I'm with the... Uh, I'm the president of the Harris County Young Democrats, and I'm pretty involved in uh, local activism and uh, community organizing here in Houston. Very nice. And uh, my name is Jess Rodriguez. Some of y'all may know me as Jumpin' Jess. I'm the current chairperson for NHPO, and I'm applying for the job as the Texas, new Texas coach. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't do any worse. <laughs> Dang. Ouch. Um, good evening. I'm Christina Flores. I am a teacher in Pasadena. I am currently the vice chair for NHPO, the National Hispanic Professionals Organization here in Houston, and will be um, chair for 2014 for NHPO as well. Congratulations. Our wow. first uh, female chair. He finally figured it out how to do it right. After 10, first years. After 10 years, he finally did the right thing. I mean, y'all must have some hard-headed members. Wait, I'm a member, too. I mean, it's the year of the woman. That's the, That's the way it should be. I mean, they run the house anyways, right? That's right. That's it. Exactly. Okay. I mean, I'll be honest. You know. Okay, let's not get cocky, Christine, okay? <laughs> it's the truth. My wife runs my house. I'll be the first one to say it. I'm not going to lie. Ben, you know it's true. I already know. I see the whippings all the time. You know it. You know. <laughs> ben, I'm glad he ain't the one getting them. I call Ben and say, hey, man, you want to go somewhere? Hold on, let me ask Iris. <laughs> and he puts me on hold. Can I go? No? Okay. No, I can't go. <laughs> <I'm booked>. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Current well, events. What's going on out there? Well, Colorado is gonna they're gonna allow marijuana to be sold it's gonna be a new law mm -hmm. and i tell you what i am all for legalization of marijuana i don't know how you all feel uh, but i think money is a driving force for the drugs and so if we cut that that profit out i think that would go a long way in cutting crime you know what ben i think i feel i feel this i, I hate to say it but i think that's 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 the only solution is to legalize it, and that way we can control it more. And I, I hate to say that because, you know, being as a staunch conservative that I am, <laughs> you know, the... Uh, 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 laughs. The, yeah, the, the crime and punishment. But, no, I think it, it, it makes sense. I mean, we've been trying the other way for, for you know, since forever, and uh, I think legalizing it is going to make us uh, get, get a better control of, of, of the whole situation. So our Democratic Party friends, how do they feel? Oh, he's a big head, so... Yeah, he's <laughs> Let me give you an example of what we did. Uh, we were doing endorsements for the city elections that were coming coming up. A lot of the questions that are usually asked are, uh, well, what are what are the most important things that you're going to do for the city? Mm -hmm. Well, we went beyond that. One of the questions that we actually had, and one of our members, uh, committee members, was asking is, what is your take on legalization of marijuana? And we had an array of questions uh, regarding that in other words some were actually some of the representatives were a little uh you know in the beginning a little held back on you know hey is this going to be okay if we i talk about it here and surprisingly a super majority of individuals who were running for office said they're for either um medical marijuana being uh, legalized 
or uh, legalizing it altogether and taxing it. Keep in mind that half our prisons are filled with folks that have been charged because of drug possession or selling drugs. Uh, so that would alleviate a lot of those uh, prisons. Hmm. What do you think, Jose? You're the big, uh, you know, you're the one that worked in law enforcement. Uh, tea years. party, like you know, tea oh, party. Yeah, what, what's the tea party say there, Jose? <laughs> tea party. <laughs> <laughs> now that was funny. More like champurrado. Let's see here. I, uh, it's a, I, I don't support the use of drugs that are yeah. for unregulated purposes, right? But there are there are some good uses for it, and there are some medical uses for it to where it, it can be helpful. And it's actually, I, I've heard, and I haven't used it, that it's better to use that than some of the drugs that are prescribed already. You know, so why not allow that use to be allowed inside the, the, the you know, medical system that exists out there? So you never inhaled in the north side? No, I didn't, you know, that's a different story. We'll, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> You're from the East End, y'all I mean, grew it in your backyard, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, God. Did you, you have to bring it up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, East End, oh, they grew in the backyard. <laughs> and, and the Northsiders, well, no, I'll leave it alone. We'll okay. go to the East End to get it. What about Christina? What do you feel about that? I'm against it, actually. Okay. I'm totally against it. Um, I don't condone it in any way. Being a, an, a teacher, being an educator, being in the classroom, um, I think it sends the wrong message to our youth. Mm -hmm. I think it sends a message that, oh, Okay, if, if, we, if they legalize that, then that's going to say, oh, okay, well, it's okay if you do that. And so I think it might cause them to actually kind of lose their focus and say, well, if we can do this, we can start breaking other rules. And I, I think it'll take away that sense of responsibility to our children. But, we, but alcohol causes right. way alcohol? much more damage with the overuse of it. You know, you can that's sit there and, and, and have an alcoholic uh, overdose. Well, that's what, uh, you know, I forgot the proper term. But you can only smoke, smoke so much weed, you know, after you pass out. You're not going to, you know, die of an overdose from smoking weed, unless I'm mistaken. You know, and if somebody out there, you know, can say something otherwise, if you, if you have a different position in regards, to America, uh, in regards to marijuana, I'm going to call in, we'll put the number on the screen. But if you legalize it, where are we going to legalize the growth of the product from? Now we're going to, let's talk about the business of, of the marijuana, right? Are we going to allow the the, the legalized imp, imp, import of marijuana, medical, mar, medical marijuana, or are we going to mandate that it get grown in the United States? If you actually do that, I mean, a lot of the subsidies that exist for other products, because if you didn't know, there's actually some products that are sold in Mexico that are cheaper to buy, that are raised in, in, in the United States. It's cheaper to buy those products in Mexico than to buy Mexican products that are grown there in Mexico because of our, our, our government way of subsidizing the growth of, of those, you know, those products. I'm talking about fruits and vegetables, and you were just talking about tomatoes before we started the show. But think about the, the, wor the world of marijuana. How would that change the entire system? You, okay, you can tax it, but now you're going to create an entire supply chain of product and create a whole new industry inside the United States that at the end of the day, I mean, we got... You know, we got factories and micro factories all over the place. So, what are we going to ha start having? Every corner having a micro uh, marijuana pl uh, shop? Yeah. Ben, what, what, what is? I don't know. You, you brought it up. What? What? How are they going to regulate it? Uh, did you read that? Well, I know that in California that they've had a lot of folks uh, get into the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have all kinds of workshops and all kinds of information out there on how to get into the business, and, and there's a big boom right now. Uh, now the question is: now, California only ad allows medicinal, right? They, for medical, use. for medical reasons, yeah. right? Okay. So you have the drug lords that are going to be hurting basically in California because uh, their drug is not worth as much as it used to be. Okay. Now you will find a lot of people taking advantage of it because all you need is a prescription from a doctor saying that you need it or you you should have it, and they are able to get this uh, weed or marijuana. Uh, so it's going to lead to other things as well that uh, I wouldn't say it's the best idea uh, as far as uh, making it legal for for medical uses. I think it should be legalized overall. Well, we've already experienced this once in this country. Yeah. Let's go back to the days of prohibition. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we banned the use of alcohol and it created all those speakeasies and all this other underground industry just like we have right now. You know, when you when you make when you legalize it. Whatever it may be, when you once you legalize it, 
you create another industry for it and you take away that profit. extra neg yeah. negative element because there's negativity in everything there's yeah. always going to be i mean no matter if it's legalized or not but there's just more ability to regulate that that world how do you feel jesse as long as i can get the teaching chong franchise <laughs> <laughs> There, there you go. Smokehouse. There you go, baby. <laughs> uh, Comic relief. I want, I, want, I want the distribution rights. That's it. I mean, I mean, well, you know, Jumping <laughs> Guest has been researching just for years. I mean, since he was a teenager. You know, and, and back uh, when he had long hair. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we brought everything. We got the beat headphones. I mean, I'm looking at these kids with a little B on their head. And they actually think they're cool. It's like, man, there's some headphones. I'm like, seriously? Very expensive headphones. Well, but they're just headphones. Yeah. But bear, bear in mind, the same regulation that's put on uh, tobacco and alcohol will be put on uh, marijuana if mm -hmm. it's uh, legalized, uh, like statewide, like Colorado. In fact, interesting enough, the police and law enforcement have gotten involved uh, at the different conventions and different places. I was reading an article how they're going out there and telling people, hey, before you get out there, and they'll, they'll, the police are literally giving out little packets of food and other things like that before you go out. Uh, don't, don't forget to like not smoke and drive. Mm -hmm. And so th there's things that are going to be happening that's very similar to uh, what we do with alcohol or tobacco uh, and, you know, how the advertising gets done for it as well. The same thing that happened with Camel cigarettes. You know, it's too cartoony. Uh, it's very reminiscent of, uh, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. So those, those types of things are going to be also in play as well and how those are going to be regulated uh, in states like Colorado and future states that do mm -hmm. legalize it. And as, a, as we see it nationwide, uh, uh, court cases uh, left and right, it's being pushed back to the states, and it's going to get to a point where it's going to uh, it's going to conglomerate together, where um, you know cases are going to get piled up, where it's going to go from uh, state back to federal, but on a bigger uh, initiative. Well, one thing that I found very interesting is the states that are going to approve this are from the West Coast and the East Coast. Everybody in the center has not approved it. Not a single state in the center of the United States has approved this. So it's kind of working this way, if you will. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but if you look at Texas, though, we're basically a conservative state. We don't even have gambling here, so I don't think it's going to be a long. We're going to be one of the last we're states at, that, that's, that's absolutely right. Have that. You're absolutely right. You know, we're such a you know Bible Belt conservative state that we'll be the last ones to come come across it. We can't get gambling in in the Texas area. Well, they have it casinos in uh, California, Colorado, and a lot of other places, New Mexico. So I think it, we're, if we if it happens here, it's, it's going to be very much we're going to be down on the list. We'll be one of the last states to prove yeah. it. I think in Texas we have some of the uh, the most outspoken hypocrites out there. Oh yeah. Because we have every night we have buses bus loads of people getting shipped to uh, Louisiana to go gamble, and right. we have people in the maquinitas every single night. If you don't know what yeah. that is, a little machine, the game rooms yeah. that exist. You're right. I mean, yeah. it's like we act so conservative, but then we no, we portray to be conservative, then we act, you know, like sinners. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the politics of this. Uh, obviously, you're with the Democratic Party. I mean, when do you when do you see marijuana being legalized? When it becomes a blue state? When Texas becomes a Democratic state? I think even when it becomes a Democratic state, I think we have uh, some work ahead of us there, because uh, we still have rural areas that we'll need to talk, talk with, and also. For them, there's a benef benefit of if it's a farming aspect, then that's going to also become an issue as well. Well, great. It's not just also the, the, rec the recreational or the medical use of it. There's also industrial use of it as well. Uh, there's products that you can make with mm -hmm. uh, with hemp. Paper, clothing. I mean, there's the whole industry. There's different kinds of oils. In fact, you can make plastics from it as well. So that's a huge industry. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a weed. So it can grow anywhere. So that's that's another factor too. So petroleum may not be in a, may not appreciate it because of the fact that it'll take away some of the industry from from the the standard petroleum industry. You know, so if you can replace it with a cheaper product to create the same thing, that other industry is going to be fighting it tooth and nail. You know, it's like creating. If you haven't uh -huh. heard the story about the hundred mile carburetor that was done back in the thirties yeah. and forties, and all of a sudden just disappeared because we're we want to make sure we spend as much gas as we want. As we need to. You know, I'm sure Detroit will be against it because no, Cheech and Chong could make a ban out of it. But I think anytime <clears throat> when you challenge the profitability of any industry, you know, with a new product, that industry is going to fight it tooth and nail.
right? I mean, look at Blockbuster. It's gone now, but they fought tooth and nail not to fight, That's not right. to be able to rent movies in the corners. Mm -hmm. They lost, now they're gone. So eventually the people have to stand up and, and take control of the, of the situation to find a cheaper product, you know? Because there are cars that run on water, but we can't buy them. Okay, so awkward silent <laughs> moment. <laughs> Sorry, I don't need to. Wow, y'all are listening to me. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. <laughs> you're, you're, Next you're, topic, you're, come you're on. Real heavy on us, Jose. Right? I'm, I'm over here making. Hey, it's it's the, the best jokes. way to start the new year <laughs> is with loot. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Well, on a side <laughs> note, there was a young lady that has been missing for three days now, mm -hmm. pregnant. Uh, they suspect foul play, and they actually kind of birded in there that uh, she was last going to see her ex or her estranged husband. So apparently something happened there. Police are looking at Cypress Creek right now mm -hmm. to find out if they can find her body. Uh, so it's unfortunate, you know, during the holidays, especially uh, when you have tragedies. Uh, I, I was thinking about that young boy, the three-year-old boy that was thrown out of the window in New York City mm. uh, about a week and a half ago by an estranged husband or a strange father, if you will, um, because uh, he didn't want to give the child back to the mother. Mm -hmm. And so all these tragedies during the holidays, it's, it's, it's really sad. Uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of people that need counseling, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be for spousal abuse, child abuse, drug abuse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, I don't know what the solution is though. I mean, there's just so much of it going on. And you see, you hear about these suicides, uh, somebody kills their wife and then kills themselves and you know you see it on the news all the time unfortunately every time you turn on the news you hear something bad I know but I've been thinking of the matter is that everybody's always asking that million dollar question why does somebody kill somebody why does somebody you know beat up somebody why does somebody cheat on their wife when like Tiger Woods is out there why is he doing those things you know bottom line I think it's just the easy answer but nobody wants to say the easy answers they don't have God in their life you know they don't have some kind of faith in their life if they had some kind of foundation in that these things wouldn't happen you know they wouldn't have, if they just follow the basic Ten Commandments or rules and had a little respect that's what happens but everybody wants to make it you know uh, the million dollar question of you know why they people do this why people do that you know and uh, to me, the answer is simple. If they had God in their life, it would be no problem. And I think it's a cultural thing as well, Ben. Um, I'm pursuing a counseling career myself, and so um, I've noticed um, in my studies and in my, um, my experience in education, especially in the Latino community, I think there's a, that lack of knowledge, that lack of knowing what's available to them, and lack of knowing um, what the resources are. And so a lot of the times they rather, I think a lot of people, like you guys are saying, take, might take the easy route and, and finding a solution to their problems rather than seeking that assistance that's out there for them. And we don't do that as a community. Yeah. Well, th you're talking about uh, the situation that some of the community might be in, you know, depending on where a person comes from, our worst may be, may be their best that they've ever experienced. You know, for us living in a one bedroom, you know, one bedroom, with a kitchenette with a toilet inside of it with running water might be terrible with another with another 300 units that, and you know and a door that's broken that might sound like a terrible situation for us to be living in but for another person that came from living in a cardboard box you know and sharing that cardboard box with three other families and to make the trip to the united states that can be their luxury you know so a lot of times we come, you know, for us that might look at that situation and say, well, how can you treat your children like that? How can you let them walk around with those tore up shoes and those tore up pants? Well, it may be that this is the first pair of pants that they've ever gotten because they come from a situation where they didn't even have pants. And so culturally, I think there's a, so much more that has to be done. And I personally have experienced it where I, you know, in my own family that lives still in Mexico and I look back and it's like, okay, you know, we look at the culture uh, I, I got to a moment where I would look back and, and almost be critical condescending like some of us get to that point because we're like, man, why are they still doing that? But then I would think back and say, hey, they just haven't learned. We have to keep educating them that that's the next step. But here's the risky part. There are so many resources, right? We can get free everything now that people actually start not wanting to get to the next level because they'll lose those resources. Because we know people out there that, that say, okay, I'm getting free CHIP, free Medicaid, all these services that the Democratic Party strongly supports and the Republican Party claims that they want to monitor. There's a difference, right? But 
at the end of the day, there are people that say, okay, I'm getting three, four, five, six hundred dollars a month for free, but I don't want to make that extra five dollars an hour. I don't want to get that extra, you know, pay raise or the next, you know, bump up in my career because I'm going to lose those services. So how do you get someone to, to jump that? Because it is a true thing that needs to be decided upon almost every single day. There are families who intentionally do not go to the next level because they're going to lose those services. What do you tell those families? Yeah, you know, it's, there's a lot of a lot more people on food stamps than there were many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, there's a steady increase, and that's even during the Republican Absolutely. presidential uh, when uh, President Bush was there. The, that it was went still into. In, it was just constant, yeah, as const, up. constant incline of people that are on welfare. Now, what's the answer? I don't know. Uh, but I feel like it's very important that we get people to work and get them off food stamps if possible. But yes, but how? Yeah. How do they learn to not be dependent on that service? We have a caller on the line. You want to chime in? Well, personally, I don't think that you'll ever be able to do it. Okay. Um, there's, and I do mean that sincerely. Um, there, you cannot force individuals to work. That's you, you to, was once known as slavery, which has obviously been outlawed in this country. The fact that an individual receives a free or low cost and no cost benefit directly given to them, human nature begins to take hold. We're human. We do things according to habit, and they will simply continue to receive that service mm -hmm. as long as they possibly, as long as the service is available, period. End of story. Right. And, and you, you know, you, I, I'm looking at television. You obviously have a very learned, educated, and well-grounded uh, uh, guest there. But really, to be honest with you, we taxpayers, we people who worry about our jobs and, and all the other things, we're primarily the suckers because you're quite right. Um, a free benefit or benefit that someone is receiving, why should they take a risk on getting a job that provides health care benefits when their kids are getting free benefits? Why should they take a risk in going to work every day, being on time, fighting traffic, dealing with supervisors, customers, people who upset them every day, when they can certainly get a money benefit every month and not have to worry about a raise? Why should they? And to be honest with you, uh, the way the society here is in, in the United States, um, quite frankly, um, they may be the wiser ones because the pie is pretty much gone for us who are, are out here struggling uh, if we're not outsourced. Uh, we're kept at uh, low wages because, quite simply, uh, the employers don't have to pay higher wages. There right. are unions. There's nothing to prevent them from doing anything. It's the right to work state. So, quite literally, it's very, it, it's pretty bad on this side of the fence. Mm -hmm. So, Nate. I understand your, your discussion. I'll continue listening. But I think that for all <coughs> purposes, um, what, what we have here, the only way this can be reversed is that these subsidies these stipends, these awards be literally eliminated unless the person is completely incapacitated through illness or through a mental instability. Uh, other than that, that's all. Because I'm an African American, and I can tell you now that from, from, from the experience that the African American community has experienced since the 1960s when welfare was introduced on a mass level, um, I'm telling you, I personally, I'll leave anyone else to make their own decision. I know many African-American uh, families have had children over the years, I'm 57, because they got an additional benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's no secret. Yep. Nobody may want to admit it, but for a woman to have multiple children with multiple men and don't even know whether they have jobs or not, what does that tell you? And, and, that's, and that's the way it's happened, unfortunately, in our community. Mm -hmm. And it continues on today. Even that though there's a change in the welfare, uh, welfare guidelines with you with the option of additional children, but that's going on for generations. Well, I appreciate the call in, and you're, and you're absolutely correct. I think it's, it, that kind of causes all socioeconomic situations, regardless of race and ethnicity. Yeah, it so, has to do with race, right, of course. So, well, we thank you for calling in. What's your name again? My name is Tony. Tony, thanks so much for calling in. Have a good night. Thank you. Third mm -hmm. you, too. Happy New Year. Goodbye. Same to you. Happy New Year. And that was a very good, good information. Uh, I agree. Uh, if you're able to work, uh, then you should get out there and work. I, everybody goes through hard times, see, and every once in a while you might need a little help. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But when you need help all your life, I totally disagree with giving you help. 
So you sound like a Republican right now. You sound like a Tea Partier. <laughs> I'm. I would say that I, I'm conservative when it comes to this kind of issue. Okay. Because uh, there's millions of people that can work and they're not working. Mm -hmm. And sure, there's some people that can find a job. I understand that. Um, maybe uh, they're in a career path that uh, it's kind of hard to find a job in their career path, and perhaps they need to go back to school and get some help. Great. Uh, we we want to help those that want to help themselves. Absolutely. You know, you made a good point real quickly in regards to that. Sometimes you have that salary base where you don't want to get more. But I heard something like next year the minimum wage is going up. Is that correct? No, not yet. So I heard that somewhere. That yeah, I think I heard I in some states. In some, in some yeah, states. states. Not in and, Texas. No, no. And unemployment benefits are about to run out for a lot of people as well. Is that correct? Yeah, they just did. Yeah. They just did. Yeah. It's not in your budget. Yeah. They sure did. No. no? You know, when you when when it, when push comes to shove, people actually start getting to work. You know, yeah. and, and I think that's what happens in a lot of the foreign countries. When there's no place to eat, you're going to do a, a real, and, and people can take it however they want. A real man or woman is going to do what they're going to do, everything they can to feed their kids. Right? They'll clean. Uh, I'll do it. I'll clean toilets. I'll wash windows. I don't care. If I have to use that to feed my kids and go to work, oh, yeah. I'll do whatever I have to do. And, and I think it's gotten to a point to where some people are held back because they'll lose the ability to continue feeding their kids rather than go work. And it's a tough situation. I think one of the other things that uh, it's also important that we're missing, there's that gap. That gap is uh, there's skills in the job world that are not being, uh, people aren't able to get to yet. And so... Uh, for example, education system we see right now, the, inf the inflation on the price for school, like going into a, a one-year or two-year program or a four-year program is, is a lot more expensive than it was 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh, or 20 years ago. I remember uh, one of my uncles telling me when he went to school, he basically went, uh, he worked one summer and it paid for his whole entire year of schooling. And enough to go out and have friends, you know, hang out with friends and do other things as well. Mm -hmm. One summer. Imagine doing that now. And the opposite is also true. We're having to import uh, foreign laborers to work general labor jobs, you know, because we can't find qualified general labor, you know, because a, a $20, $25 an hour general labor job out in the sun, working hard, you know, what we were raised doing, some people just don't want to do it. And there's, there's, that's why, if you, there's a, there's a man that stands on the corner of I-10 and, and, um, federal every single day in a hard hat says general labor jobs here now. He's out there recruiting people to work. And, you know, he stands there every single day for a company and he, that's his job is to stand out to recruit people. So it, it works both ways. You know, the higher tech jobs, you don't have people with the qualified levels of education, but even the. The, I don't want to say lower tech, but the, the labor jobs that require high tech knowledge of your body and the use of your body to be able to perform that job, because it does, you, you, need, you need some skills. You got to be able to work out in the sun. There aren't people willing to do that either. By the way, if you're looking for a job, Walmart is hiring right now on Wayside and uh, 45. They're looking for people today, mm -hmm. literally. No yeah. joke. Everybody's hiring. I mean, in my world, I'm an insurance agent, and of all the insurance agents that I know that I work with directly, every single one of us are hiring. And it's so hard because we can't find, when we do get an applicant, out of every 10 applicants we get, uh, three get past the first phase, which is a clean criminal background. Second phase is saying, okay, you know, let's, can, we, can, can we get you past the credit, credit check? You know, you bring up a good topic. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the issues you need to break you need a break and you go no 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 okay. no <laughs> i just thought we we're supposed to take a break <laughs> uh, yeah he wants to take a quick part no i'm just kidding no in, in all honesty we're we'll, uh we're gonna take a one second quick quick break just so we can uh, let you know where we're at and we'll be right back you're watching latino talk tv
Welcome back. You're still watching Latino Talk TV. We we're actually having a pretty heated uh, discussion before the camera started, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, we're talking about, uh, right now we're going to talk about second chances. People with uh, criminal backgrounds or even bad credit situations, do they or should they deserve a second chance? Especially in the workforce environment. You know, in, the, in this country, I think over 25% of our population is, is, has been or, or is currently incarcerated. So what happens when they come out and try to get a real job? Is it really that easy for them to get back into society and become an active part uh, and, and a productive person in what we think they should be doing? Is, that, is it that easy? So guys, what do you guys think? I'm a firm believer in second chances. Uh, some people make mistakes. I mean, we're human. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that if we penalize them throughout their lifetime and not allow them to get a good job, then we all hurt. Not just them, we all hurt, yeah. okay? So I think the second chance is Really, it's not only for, for themselves, but think about it if they have kids, okay? If they have grown kids or little kids, mm -hmm. they can't find a job. Where does that put them? McDonald's? Does it put them over there? So what's wrong with a McDonald's job? I'm just saying. I mean, I'm just saying. There's, there's certain jobs job. that require them to pass a background check, and, and it's unfortunate. The city of Houston is in a perfect example. You cannot have any kind of record. So are you saying you would be okay with a, with, a, with a convicted felon to be handling your personal information at the city of Houston? Every job is different. How, I Every mean, job is different. How, how, how much segregation city you can Houston, actually have? Let's just say city of Houston working at the at call center. Okay. Okay. I'm okay with the second chance there. Okay. So 311 call center. Hey, I'm at this, this location convicted. Uh, I'm okay here, with it. convicted child rapist handling the phone and said, hey, there's a lost child heart in the corner. You're okay I, with that? I'm okay with certain individuals. Okay, and okay. who's going to make that decision? Well, and what's going to be the right every, one? Every supervisor, every job uh, has to, uh, I guess, really uh, criticize, not criticize, but they have to determine what is best for their job. Oh, uh, well. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, let's put it this way. Uh, what if the individual, uh, you know, did theft when they were 18 or 17 years old. They did their time, they came out. Uh, in that case, working in a you know call center or something like that. Now saying uh, like any other, let's say for example, uh, heavier uh, crimes, then no. And those, and so you need to set those levels, right? What is what is the correct level? And just like any type of uh, scenario, and, and one of the things that you talked about, for example, uh, what if uh, they work in a bank? And did they did financial fraud? Of course not. I mean, it's it's a risk. And specifically, I think even insurance companies won't even insure right. the bank anymore because of that. So I think that being that being a point, I think there should be uh, pivot points where we have to look at where these individuals have come out from the system who've served their time. Where are they going to go? Right. And it is this talks about on the same level we were talking about on the previous discussion. Well, they're if they're stuck at this level, how are we going to take individuals mm -hmm. to that next level? So what's the solution? Because once they come out with a with, uh, with a felony, it's very difficult to find a job. It's just a matter of the like Ben said, it's just evaluating the situation regards to evaluating the job uh, and the, the responsibilities that are and duties of that job compared to what the uh, the crime was. So, I mean, it's going to take the HR person to really make that determination and tell them, you know what, uh, you're not best qualified for the job because of your past record. Maybe you can go into this trade or go here. Like, you know, if they did something like you said wrong when they're 17, 18, they stole some TVs at a Best Buy because their friends told them, come on, let's do it, we can make this happen. And they go apply at a car dealership and they want to be a car salesman. I don't see any problem there. So I think it's you got to look at the situation, look at the responsibilities and duties of the job, and then you got to look at the crime, and that's going to be up to an HR person to determine if that's the right job for the right person and mm -hmm. whether they give them a second chance. And after the after the HR person makes that decision and the person fails them, it's the public relations person that has to go clean up the mess. Well, that's what yeah, that's you part of the job. You take a chance job. with everybody. Yeah, yeah. even it's if they risk. don't have a record, you take a chance with them. But you know, it's it's good. But at the same time, it's good PR when you do handle. Uh, people that have had, you know, that need a second chance. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're out here. We're hiring veterans. We're hiring people that had second chance. Oh no, veterans isn't a second chance. Veterans serve their country honorably. No, but I'm saying it's good PR. That's what I'm saying. Yes, it's good PR. Well, we're talking. That's like and the people do promote apples that. and. <laughs> no, I'm just saying you're talking about good PR. Yeah, it's good PR when you hire a veteran. Yeah, but you can't put in a convicted felon in the same conversation with a with a. With well, a no, what you say if you give people a second chance, that's a good PR. 
It's well, the PR. veterans. Don't, they're not getting second chances. They deserve the chance. Period. They're, they're, they just came back from serving the country. I, That's my position. I agree with that. Um, as, as far as a convicted felon, obviously, that again, as it has been said already, there are some areas that are going to be totally off limits, such as education. I know I wouldn't want to work with um, someone who I know has been convicted of, you know, anything like that, especially being around children and, you know, in a setting such as that. But what about putting forth some sort of education requirement before they get out? Um, I know that they can get their GEDs and stuff like that while they're in there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe lean them, help them find a trade, some kind of vocational educational program that they can get into. That way they're more likely to stick to something positive when they come out. Good point. I think anything financial, you, I mean, you can't have a felon doing anything, you know, along those lines in, in that in that uh, in that segment of the workforce. I mean, you, who's going to want a, 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 a convicted felon that, you know, that's a financial advisor or something like that, or of course it can't work in anything monetary. And that, I guess that, that needs to stay that way. But there are other, you know, other other different careers, you know, just need, like I said, in general, you know, construction, you know, uh, I know, Ben, what you do in program management. Uh, perfect for felons. Yeah, perfect for felons. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or soon to be felons. Yeah. But, you know, that's Ouch. The, that's, that's the role of a career counselor. And career counselors are going to put them in the right direction, say, you know what, this is where you should go. This is where you should apply. And these people are more likely probably to hire you based on the crime that you did. So, you know, there's people out there that's going to make a difference and help them. So. Mm. And there, you're right, Jesse, there are programs actually out there that help them in that transitional process. So they help them. There's um, group counseling sessions that they can attend and where counselors help them take each step as they go. So that's actually out there for them already. Very nice. Another topic I was going to bring up, I heard this morning about something about where we got involved with NHPO. We went all out to, uh, was it Beaumont for the pipeline situation? Oh, the Keystone Pipeline. Keystone Pipeline. They're saying right. how uh, Obama is now is still putting that on hold and uh, it may not happen for his term and that you know Texas uh, is losing a lot of jobs a lot of income and that you know the country could be you know more self-sufficient on, on uh, energy and, and, and gasoline and oil if the, they allowed the pipeline to come through. Keystone so, Pipeline. Yeah the Keystone yeah. Pipeline. What I, do think you? That, I think that you know I, I'm being more moderate and, you know a little I think that needs to go through. I think that's 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 our number one line of, of industry and defense is you know our our, our blood is is uh, is is has oil in it that's that's just the way the blood of the country is, is oil and uh, I think it, it needs to happen. Well, I think I I agree with you. Um, the reasons behind the scenes of what's going on is uh, you have a lot of environmental groups that are yeah. pushing against it, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're tree huggers or. Uh, they they want to save the land, uh, and it's unfortunate that it's taking this long for the president and others to make a decision on that. Yeah. Well, I like hugging trees. Good for you. <laughs> I enjoy nature, and, and I and I honestly get tired of seeing those little yellow signs everywhere, and seeing those random explosions of pipelines all over the place. But yes, we are an oil and gas driven environment. Yeah. But like anything else, we keep doing the same thing over and over again, not trying new things. That industry doesn't want to lose its, its revenue, and we don't put our attention on all these other ways of, pro of providing the same resources for us, you know, to be able to get off our dependency of oil and gas. Our companies are keeping us in control. Of that if you haven't, there's a in Spain, there's actually entire farms to capture you know, capture solar energy. You know, what are we doing over here? We're putting windmills to create. You know, I just think we're 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 still held hostage by our own industries here in Texas. You know, do I support this pipeline? What's the next thing going to be? You know, when that, that pipeline runs out, we're going to redirect it? Well, there's always a possibility. At least for right now, I hope it will drop the gas by at least a dollar or something. <laughs> I would like that. It's going to go back down. <laughs> we're used to it. We, we, don't, we don't scream anymore. I mean, think about it. But if there's a surplus, of course, they're going to have to bring the price yeah, down. Until it runs out. I think it would be if they, you bring it down by like 15 cents. Yeah. That's it at most. The profit margins yeah. and the tax credits that they get, there's no need for them to bring the price down. It'll come down every election year. It always does. Right there at the yeah. next election. And it goes right election. back up after it. You know? <laughs> it'll, bring, it'll bring it down another it's 50 like, cents, 70 cents. In a city this big, our, our, the city of Houston should have a, a massive public transit system in place already. But we're behind. We're, we're, we're generations behind it. Why? Because we, we're, we're, we love our toll tags, 
you know, think about it, the loss of, imagine all the loss in revenue, if the, the county lost all its toll road uh, activity. You know, who would get the money then? You know, one train can carry, what, a thousand cars, two thousand cars, that money's going to go away. So, I mean, it doesn't benefit the county and all the toll roads to create public transit. You know, it, it, it's just all about the money. I mean, at the end of the day, think about that. What's the city going to do? Metro is a city county partnership but it's mainly run by but i think if you look at the other side jose the you know the transportation is within 610 everything else with regards to the tolls is outside 610 it's you know to go further this is for more of an inner city transportation so you know trying to get everybody to move back into the hood so that way they can use this uh, metro no, but why why don't we have uh rapid transit from all the different uh you know park and ride locations why don't we have that why do we keep buying buses and replacing those buses to be on the road when we know that they're going to park there. You know, they're already established. We should have a, a, a bullet train from downtown to there every single day. Why You're don't right. we have that? You're right. Well, because we don't have the right people on, on the board. No right people on the, and you know. Less roads on the street. Now we have hot lanes on I-10. Yeah. It's all about the money. You yeah. know, they like the leadership. That's what the revenues are going to go somewhere else. So. Well, we're going to have uh, a lot of people running for office soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have probably in, um, Hillary Clinton running for president. Mm -hmm. You probably know this more than I do. Uh, we're going to have perhaps Marco Rubio from Florida running for office for president maybe. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next presidential cycle. Uh, I, I think you're going to have the, the strong right conservatives and then the strong left and then you're going to have people in the middle and people are going to decide which way they're going. I, I think that the only way anybody's going to win is if both parties throw out a good moderate, male or female. Yeah. Yeah. Someone needs to be moderate on both sides of the table. they gotta, they got to play, play both sides because this extreme environment doesn't work. can't be an extreme Democrat to give everything for free, and you can't be an extreme Republican yeah. where you give nothing to anybody. You know? Yeah, I've been throwing Ted Cruz's name out there a lot. Uh. And all the all the Sunday uh, the Sunday talking head shows, you know. Well, he if he wins, he'd be the first Latino, <laughs> first Latino president. Oh, That'd yeah. be interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd yeah. like to he, see a woman, about as much Latino. a woman be Tom president. Cruz. Maybe Hillary Clinton. I think that'd be great. Um, just just to spark it up a little bit. What do you think? I totally agree. So can women lead or what? <laughs> let's see. Let's talk about. It. We got 15 minutes left in the show. Tell us what you're gonna do with NHPO. Well. Um, thank you for asking, Jose. I'm glad you were asking me that question. Um, I just, I just feel as though it's, you know, you're talking earlier about change that you're okay with change, and hopefully, you know, everyone else is a little bit more acceptant and, um, and receiving to that same idea as well. I just, um, me personally, I, I like taking on a challenge, and so um, I'll hopefully I'll be running my third marathon this year, uh, coming up January 19th, and from that I've learned, um, you know, the, just like the saying goes, any there's. If there's anything you want to do, as long as you set your mind to it, you can actually do it. And so I've, I've seen that in my personal life, and I kind of want to take that on, too, with the organization. So that's kind of the, the mentality that I'm taking forth with it. Um, if I can run 26.2 miles, I feel like I can carry the organization for the rest of the year. So Only 26 miles? Only 26 miles. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. You know, I know you're a teacher, <laughs> but... I mean, how did you get involved with NHPO? Where are you from? Are you from Houston? Or? I'm from Houston, yep. Born and raised. Uh, what here. part of town? Uh, Does that matter? To Pasadena. Oh, Pasadena? Um, okay, well, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, where I grew up. Um, but, of course, I love the city. Um, graduate of Pasadena High School, uh, graduate of U the University of Houston Central Campus, and this year we'll be receiving my master's from the University of St. Thomas as well. Wow. So um, education is definitely something I'm big on, which is why I mentioned it earlier. But I really feel that as though NHPO has the potential to move Hispanics and actually the whole city in the right direction. I feel like it, it's, it has a potential to be a premier organization that people for, of all backgrounds, of all nationalities and races can come to and benefit from. Um, and I, I kind of want to bring that back. That's a value that might have maybe been there in years past. And I think maybe we lost it just a little bit in, in these past couple of years. But I definitely want to keep the momentum going. We have good, we're going in good, in a good direction with good strides right now. So I want to keep that momentum going for 2014. Christina, uh, what is, for the uh, viewer that doesn't know, what is NHPO, what does it stand for, and what's, what is it all about? 
That's a great question, Jesse. NHPO is, again, the National Hispanic Professionals Organization, and our mission is to provide professional development for our members, leadership, training, and career opportunities. And so it's a network-based organization. Uh, we do a lot of community service events throughout the year as well. We provide that for our members. And it's a way just to kind of meet people, Houstonians and other people from across the country as well through our, through our other chapters um, of different backgrounds. It's a way to network, uh, promote your business, promote yourself. Um, in my own personal experience, I've come across a lot of wonderful individuals. I've met a lot of wonderful people, such as the cast here and everyone here. Um, and it just provides an opportunity to reach out to others um, in ways that maybe you couldn't have before. And so I've definitely gained a lot being a member and being on the board as well. well I have to congratulate Ben Mendez, who's our founder for the exactly. National Hispanic Professional Organization. And I know Ben has been a great idea. It was a great idea and it's still a great idea. And I think that the, f the point that people love uh, NHPO is because you don't have to own a business to be a part of it, like the National, like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. You don't you even have to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> you can collect. Boogie, boogie, you don't even have boogie, to be a Hispanic. Be part of this group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can be oh, unemployed and you can, yeah, <laughs> collect the welfare and still be part of NHPO. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for. You know, professional people that are, you know, we have teachers, we have pharmacists, we have doctors, we have lawyers that are all part, all parts of the spectrum, teachers. Uh, and we met, you know, met a lot of great people. We got real estate agents, we got insurance agents. We have a uh, broad, you know, a lot of people that are involved in nonprofit organizations that are leading those boards. And, you know, and uh, it's a great resource to really bring people together that can help each other. And I think that's what Ben did. And I think, I mean, I, that's one reason I love the idea is that where it's it's a uh, it's it's a platform where a lot of organizations, especially nonprofit organizations, can come by and and seek help of other professionals who are CPAs, lawyers, and people that want to give back to the community. And I think it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a great organization. That very I think that we don't get enough publicity about it. No people don't know about it. So thank you, Jose, and uh, for bringing this on and let us talk about it. And uh, we you know we with Christina have some great goals. I was a, a chairperson for the past two years and. You know, I think Ben for getting me back involved, and and uh, then the Leadership Institute, which Javier has, which, which is he's been leading, and I was uh, a graduate of the Leadership Institute, and it really kind of awakened my inner soul to get more back involved in the community and wake up those leadership skills that I kind of had buried and dormant, and brought those out again. So okay. I think it's nothing been a, been nothing but a great blessing uh, for me, and it can for everybody else that wants to get involved. And, you. uh, and you're a member of it too, right? You're part of the LA? I am. Actually, I'm uh, the class 10. We're finishing up. We're having our graduation next week. It's very exciting. Uh, it's, I, one of the greatest things I, I, I took away from this is the, the amazing group of individuals they can bring together uh, in Houston from all over, all over the city uh, to come work together to build relationships that you would have never built before. All nationalities. All nationalities. Mm -hmm. Uh, I myself am, I'm background heritage Persian, so uh, being part of a Hispanic organization, meeting new individuals, uh, you know, people from, um, we have pe people from universities mm -hmm. up to basically uh, late in their career uh, about to retire. Mm -hmm. So it's really fascinating. So this, we got nine minutes left and I want to make sure that the on the website, on the, on the TV screen, you will have the actual website of NHPO, so how you can actually reach them directly and the phone number also. So give us the website. It's uh, Currently it's www.nhpo.us. Okay, nhpo.us and the phone number? Um, That'd be Christina's number. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no stop this, please. <laughs> Start now. Start now. You're on the, you're on the hook. No. Um, sure. I mean, I don't mind. I can be contacted directly 832-431-7254. Okay, you cut that one time. We're not going to put the number on the screen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, we got nine minutes left. I want to make sure that we cover, uh, number one, the good about 2013 and the better for 2014. Real quick going around. And then at the end, also some quick tips on networking. Because a lot of people think that networking is just show up and get something. And that's not networking. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just show up and think you're going to get everything out of it. That's number one. <laughs> number two, I learned that if I keep hanging out with the same people, I'm going to keep getting the same results. So I have to push myself out of my own network. If I see the same people at the same networking session over and over again, I gotta find a new place to network. True or not? Yeah. True. yeah. All right, so real quick, we'll go on this way. In, in nine minutes left, let's cover the show. 2014, what are you gonna do? 
Um, well, just to kind of expand on what you're saying, you know, um, bring an HPO toward the forefront of, of Houston and give everyone that opportunity, like has had been said before as well, to build definitely build some genuine relationships with people. Uh, for me, it's spending more time with my family. Running a campaign for a year, uh, you spend a lot of time away from the family. So 2014 is about family for me. Awesome. Uh, 2014 is going to be about the election year. Uh, for Texas, specifically the governor's race with Wendy Davis. Awesome. 2014 for me is uh, kind of spreading out and getting more involved in more boards. Uh, I've just joined the Denver Harbor Senior Citizens uh, Board. Also, the, I've gotten more involved in the Knights of Columbus, which is a, a Catholic uh, gentleman's organization mm -hmm. that helps increase your faith and, and does and gets you closer to doing more things for the for the church. and. Uh, I'm kind of a rookie, but I've been uh, getting me meeting a lot of good people, and I think that's been good. And also, too, I want to, you know, made a personal commitment to NHPO and to uh, Christina. I really want to push this, uh, the, the name of NHPO and get more uh, publicity, more branding, uh, get our name out there more in the street to, because people do know about us, but they don't know everything we do. We, we kind of got a. Uh, a stigma of being a more of a party organization, but it's not, you know, not the truth. We've been doing a lot of great things. We had a, a we did a lot of things in the community. I mean, I could talk a whole show about what we just did this year in our involvement, but, um, and I guess more self-development and, and more developing my leadership skills. That's what my plan is for 2014. Okay. And just want to remind you, like you said about networking, we are having our first uh, networking event. It's going to be, uh, January the 9th, Thursday, and uh, soon to be announced the location. Okay. So, but it's going to be January 9th. And if you want more information, just uh, go to our nhpo.us uh, website or you can go e email Christina at nhpochair at gmail.com or just give her a call. Awesome. Thank you so much. Javier? I tell you, I'm moving to Colorado to become a marijuana farmer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. I'll be a truck driver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. No, I, I, I was just talking, speaking about networking, I was just talking about, about with well, this was Jess yesterday, you know, we, me and Jess, we, we've been uh, uh, going to church together. We're a couple now. <laughs> okay. oh but, but anyway, one, one thing I was telling Jess uh, uh, was, uh, you know, I said, if you want to network su successfully, I said, I, I look at Jess's son, Omar. And I know, I know a, a lot of you out there know Omar. He, he's a special needs, needs uh, adult. Uh, adult. But I tell you, if you look at Omar, he networks like no other person I've ever seen. He is there. He's introducing himself. He's asking people what they do. He's going around telling them what he likes, what do you like. He's asking all the right questions. You learn from Ben and Mendes. I, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, but Omar does a fantastic job of, of, of networking, you know. And, and I tell you, Omar, is, is, it's, he's the greatest person, you know. One of the reasons I'm going to church where I'm going is because Omar kept asking me to go. And, and when you get there, and he just turns around and just like his face lights up because you're there with him. Wow. You know, I would say, man, I mean, I, my, my kids don't do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but Omar such a great, but I tell you, you could learn it's a that lot again. from him. You could learn a lot from him. So we got a couple minutes left, and thank you so much. And, and just some real quick tips on networking. You know, like I said, uh, for me, number one is trying to connect people. And another thing is smiling. I have this, this very serious face most of the time when people, I'm so focused that I have a very stern look. And people get, you know, they, they, they say I'm not approachable. You know, but I'm not. I'm usually a nice guy. So number one, smile. Two, connect people. If you know that person does one thing and they need something else, put them together. They'll return the favor later. I, I think that's what one thing that Ben does very, very well. Yeah. He does that very well, and he puts people together. You know, he'll remember. Oh, well, this person can help you out. He'll 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 remember things. Ben, you do an excellent job at that. And he, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say the same thing is that, you know, that's what we have to do. I'm more of a shy person, even though I was on radio and talked a lot. I am basically a shy person. But Ben goes out of his way to say, do you know this person, Jesse, or do you know this person? And and I, I love that. And I, I'm trying to do more of that where I'm starting putting people together because mm -hmm. that's that's what you, like you were talking about, Jose, connecting people because we don't do enough that we're not aggressive enough as, a, as our culture. We're more of, our, of a shy you know, uh, individuals of our personalities because they're, I know that that's another story, but we're the kind of always looking down and not looking up. Ladies, tips? For 2014? No, no, networking. networking. Oh. <laughs> 
um, just again, like, same thing, just to get out there more. Don't don't be shy. <laughs> um, get just get to get to talking, connect like again, connect the right people. I think the most important thing for me, because I'm really bad at memorizing people's names. Mm -hmm. For me, is uh, I have to remember people's names when they introduce themselves. Because mm -hmm. we're always thinking about our name when we're going to introduce ourselves. We don't think about what they're saying. Right. And so it's so, so important. If you remember someone's name, that goes a long way. Yep. And, and I think at any function or an event, uh, a pro usually you approach certain people like that look, you know, that are like, oh, they're, they're looking happy. I'm going to go talk. Go to that person who's, like you said, the grumpy person who's in the corner is just like, go talk to that person. Because you know what? At that moment, they might be uh, they might be thinking about something or they want get, to get themselves excited mm -hmm. to, to go out there and talk. As soon as you do that, guess what? You're going to light them up and then people around you are also going to light up too. Awesome. So on that note, we're actually out of time. And this is our last show for this year. 2013 is now over. So if you're out there watching the show, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be here again next year at the same time at 6 p.m. Uh, you're watching Latino Talk TV. Happy New Year.